<sighs> you patient souls who've been here for a long time holding your seats, welcome. I'm Jane Gould, the coordinator of the Technology and Culture Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Noam Chomsky on the Foundations of World Order, 50 years of the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Before we turn to tonight's program, I call your attention to the Technology and Culture Forum's next program, Reinventing Universities for the 21st Century. There's a sign with all the information above my head. And uh, do come Wednesday, March 3rd at 5.30 p.m. in 6120. The Technology and Culture Forum will be hosting four more programs this spring. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, you can either sign on one of the sheets of paper on the table in the hall as you leave, or go to our website and just put yourself onto the list. Now to tonight's program. We're all here because we want to hear Noam Chomsky. Chomsky is honored by MIT as an institute professor. His doctoral thesis on transformational analysis began his radical transformation of the field of linguistics. Honorary degrees, learned in professional societies, significant awards. His list is luminous. Few have escaped his notice. And yet, as a public intellectual, Professor Chomsky has always taken seriously his responsibility to stimulate and lead public debate. <coughs> In addition to speaking and writing on linguistics and philosophy, he's taken on intellectual history, contemporary issues, international affairs, US foreign policy, to name a few of his key topics. Late this last year, I received an email encouraging me to participate in a 70th birthday card for Noam Chomsky. Online, global, hundreds, thousands. The list went on and people couldn't resist saying how they'd been challenged and inspired by Chomsky. Tonight he's here to look at the last 50 years, what we created, what we have, and where we are to go. Noam Chomsky. Just realized, well, listening to Jane announce the title that it's also, just about 50 years since I walked into this building for the first time, but I won't talk about that. Uh, we've uh, just passed the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, that was a few weeks ago. The uh, human rights regime, which was uh, encoded in that declaration, is one of the pillars of the uh, system of world order that was constructed on the wreckage of World War II. Uh, there, was, uh, there were two other major foundation stones. One was the uh, international political order, which is articulated in the United Nations Charter. And the third is the uh, international economic system, uh, sometimes called the Bretton Woods system designed primarily by the United States and, and Britain uh, right at the end of the war. Uh, these three systems were closely integrated conceptually and in fact. Uh, the thinking behind them illustrates that as does the, their interactions over the years. And uh, to a degree that's quite unusual in world affairs, the three foundations uh, reflected public attitudes uh, and concerns over quite a wide range. Uh, for that very reason, the principles that were uh, articulated and uh, to some extent instituted, uh, those uh, principles were quite distasteful to elite elements 
uh, who were in a, uh, namely those who were actually in a position to construct uh, and shape and guide the actual world order. And they very quickly took steps to dismantle or at least attenuate the lofty principles. Uh, the conflicts over these matters constitutes a large part of modern history, post-Cold War history. That's not the usual framework of analysis uh, for discussing it, but in my opinion, it ought to be. Uh, well, large issues. There's a lot in print. There's many treatises uh, yet to be written, even to be researched. I don't think the topics have been addressed with anything like enough seriousness. But to try to give, I'll try to give some indication of why I think that's a, an appropriate and instructive way to uh, view the uh, uh, contemporary world system, its, its or origins, time of the Second World War, and uh, maybe its likely future. So the main question that I want to get to is uh, what has been the fate of the three basic and integrated pillars of world order that were established half century ago, and specifically what has been the role of the United States, uh, which has been the primary actor on the world scene throughout, remains so, and the one that's most important for us for obvious reasons, independently of the significance and scale of its contributions, uh, which are usually quite great for equally obvious reasons. Well, that's the main question that I want to get to, but I'd like to approach it by uh, detour, uh, just to make life more complicated. Uh, and uh, the detour has two tracks that I'd like to explore a little bit, and then from them get back to the questions. Uh, the first track uh, is simply to remind everyone of what you already know, uh, we have to bear in mind that the questions are not abstract and they're not about some distant planet. Uh, so it's not like an academic topic for an academic seminar. Uh, we're dealing with questions of life and death, of uh, suffering and pain and uh, despair. Uh, the voices that are heard, not that one, the voices that are heard <laughs> Are those of the uh, <laughs> are those of the rich and the powerful, naturally? Uh, there are also those who have sought to be uh, a voice for the voiceless. Uh, their fate hasn't been too happy. Uh, some were simply assassinated uh, by our hands, or those working for us. A chapter of modern history that uh, one doesn't read about too much. Uh, in fact, they were assassinated, and there's quite a number of them, uh, doubly, in that they were first killed and then silenced. So you can do a check and uh, see how many of your friends can tell you the names of uh, Eastern European dissidents uh, and uh, murdered, uh, their murdered counterparts in Central America, and how many books you've read by one and by the other, and so on. It's an instructive lesson. Uh, the uh, uh, but the voices that we hear, the ones that remain, are typically the powerful. And that's important because that's not the only voice. That's the voice of a small minority here and a tiny minority worldwide. Uh, well, let me illustrate from right now. Uh, there are major stories in the press these last few days uh, on the uh, G7 meetings, the meetings of the seven richest industrial countries, and on the uh, interchanges between um, the, their leaders. So, for example, President Chirac's of, of France, uh, his interchanges with uh, Robert Rubin, who I guess might be called co-president of the United States. Uh, we have to give Alan Greenspan at least half the presidency. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, uh, so that's been all over the, the front pages. Uh, and those discussions are interesting and tell you a lot. I uh, look at them closely. They, even not so closely, they reveal the outcome of these discussions, G7 and the other interchanges, reveal the power of the United States in a rather dramatic form and also its extreme isolation 
uh, even among the richest countries. And if you look a little more closely, and uh, you learn a lot about the true nature of the actually functioning international economic system of the difference between the doctrines uh, that apply to the rich and the powerful by their insistence uh, and the opposite doctrines which are imposed on everyone else. That comes out with great starkness in the articles discussing the, uh, uh, these, these issues. I'll come back to that <clears throat> in connection with the third pillar of world order, the international economic system. Well, uh, there are no stories, and I mean none, uh, on the G15 meetings, which have taken place at the same time uh, in Jamaica the last couple of weeks. Uh, in, the, in the national press, it's, uh, it's literally zero. Uh, I rely on a database search done by a friend who has access to that monster. Uh, the uh, New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal have no word on them. Uh, there's no shortage of information. Associated Press had stories that they weren't run. Uh, the BBC World Services had extensive coverage. And if you look around the peripheral press, uh, particularly in Florida, uh, there was coverage. Florida, I presume, because of the Latin American connection. Uh, but the national press blanked it out. Uh, now, these aren't, it's not that, uh, they, these aren't minor countries. These are major. These are not what are dismissed as basket cases, like Sub-Saharan Africa. This is uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, India, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria, uh, quite substantial countries in which people expect to make a lot of money if they can. Uh, 17 of them, even though it's called G15, a good part of the world. And they do have something to say, believe it or not. And you can even read it. Uh, for example, you can read it on the front page if you happen to subscribe to the uh, uh, leading journal in Egypt. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Al uh, the which has an English edition, so you can read it in English. Uh, the United States, what they say at the G15 meeting uh, is that uh, the United States and Britain, this is mostly quotes, are unwilling to enter into a dialogue with the South. Um, the South is what is euphemistically called the developing world. Uh, which direction they're developing, you can argue about. Uh, the uh, U U.S. and Britain are uh, unwilling to uh, engage, to enter into a dialogue with the South, which is always forced to make concessions in the World Trade Organization to the benefit of the rich. The true story of globalization, they continue, is that the North has, that's G7, has to make uh, maximum benefits, and the South is only entitled to a limited margin of development. And if this margin is crossed, the Western speculators are there to take you down as quickly as they can. That's not false, but it's a considerable understatement, and the writers surely know it. Uh, U.S. power and violence has also been there to take you down as quickly as it can uh, if uh, countries try to pursue the path of independent development, what's called in U.S. planning circles uh, uh, radical nationalism or economic nationalism or sometimes even excessive development. That's not to be permitted. Uh, in the current period of globalization, for reasons I get back to, uh, you don't have to send the Marines that often. The speculators can do the, can do the job. Uh, the uh, uh, G15 meeting goes on to uh, issue a plea to Western investors. It says, uh, we don't want to stifle you, but we want to know who you are, and we want you to come and go in an orderly fashion. That's precisely what the North will not accept. Uh, the demand that that not be accepted is a core part of the multilateral agreement on investments, which has been deflected thanks to uh, activist pressure, which succeeded in escaping media controls, uh, but deflected, not stopped coming back in other ways. Uh, and the point is to prevent uh, what uh, the G G15 plea from being uh, realized. Uh, 